Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, this is public meeting 255 that I am calling to order. And first up will be approval of the minutes. Commissioner Stebbins. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, in your packet, you have the minutes from the October 25th, 2018 meeting. I move the uh, commission approve those minutes subject to any corrections for typographical error, errors or any other non-material matters. Any further discussion on the minutes? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Four zero. Okay, typically now we'll have an administrative update, but Executive Director Bedrosian is working on a matter, and he will be here uh, a little later to give that review. Our um, general counsel is here, though. I am, and Mr. Bedrosian will join us later in the meeting, so he advised that we can proceed at, with the agenda as it stands. Yeah, will do. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Uh, Ombudsman John Ziemba is up next with the Plain Ridge Park Casino quarterly report. Great. Welcome to uh, the team from Plain Ridge. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Uh, so today we hear from Plain Ridge Park regarding their third quarter uh, report ending September uh, 30th of this year. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it over to Lance George, uh, General Manager for Plain Ridge Park, Michelle Collins, Vice President of Marketing for Plain Ridge Park, and Kim Rigo, Vice President of Human Resources. Good morning, you. Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. It's been a few months, I think. I tend to work quickly, so please feel free to stop me, but uh, I'll go fairly rapidly through this. <laughs> uh, gaming revenues and taxes for Q3, actually we've got some numbers up there, a lot of numbers. We've got uh, it broken down by quarter for 17, and then again for, for 18, and so revenue and tax all in for the third quarter of 2018. Combination of taxes paid and fees paid to the horsemen at 49%, totaled approximately 22 million, just under 22 million, 21,976. Gaming revenues just under 45 million. Successful quarter with a net win per unit at 397 in the month of August. So all in, good story for us. Lance, um, uh, is, is it fair to say that uh, there's a bit of an upward trend to finish the year uh, a little higher than last? Um, I mean, of course, there's third quarter, uh, fourth quarter still uh, missing, but is there anything that you can talk about that? Yeah, so. So, of course, as you guys well know, uh, competition opened around us, both at Tiverton, which is, I think, 150 yards over the Massachusetts border, as well as MGM, which is farther away, about an hour and 15, hour and a half from us. Tiverton's about 40 minutes. And so, as that relates to the impact on revenue, I think it's a bit of a wait and see. Public numbers show that we were down about 4% year over year in September. Uh, public numbers in October will come out, or for October, will come out on the 14th. And so, it's a bit of a wait and see. We did see a bit of a decline in September. And so we're certainly curious to see what happens in the last uh, three months of this year. Thank you. 150 yards, is that right? I think it's 150 yards, yes. Wow. Yeah. Actually, if you're coming from Rhode Island to get to, to the Tiverton Casino, there's, there's a, you enter Massachusetts for just a little bit on the exit to get back into Rhode Island. Very close, very close. It's that close. Is it? Lottery sales, again, a good story. Similar format to the, the previous slide. Uh, details by quarter for 17 and 18. Encouraging year-over-year -year trend sales up by just over 5% uh, for Q3, 5.24%. Increase is largely organic. No material change to our relationship or in the approach. Spending by state on the procurement side. 78% of the eligible spend for Q3 was spent in Massachusetts. Remainder is split among several other states. Purchasing team continues to produce positive results. We're certainly encouraged by these numbers, and we have been uh, all along. Local spend, Oops, let's back up a little bit. So digging a little deeper into uh, procurement for Q3 provided a breakdown of local spending. Approximately 110,000 of our procurement spend occurred with local businesses, with the majority occurring in the town of Plainville, followed by Mansfield and, uh, and North Attleboro. Good story. On the vendor diversity side, overall encouraging results. With that said, the property continues to pursue opportunities in each of these areas. Across the board, for WBEs, VBEs, and MBEs, Plain Ridge is above target and we continue to be pleased with, uh, with these results. 
No significant red flags to report. Continued assistance by Jill Griffin and Commissioner Stebbins, including earlier this week to discuss procurement and veteran diversity. Greatly appreciated and certainly valuable for the property. Compliance. Good work by the team in the area of compliance. The property continues to be diligent, and as you can see from the number of ID checks and turnaways. One individual who did make it onto the gaming floor was identified within minutes and properly escorted from the facility. Continued coordination and cooperation between the property, commission agents, and MSP <laughs> continues to be a big positive for the property. Good to hear. Lance, uh, you know, similar question. I, uh, I think these, these numbers are very uh, positive, as you say, but any reason to uh, think that some of the people trying to um, enter, that there's any kind of trends or repeat uh, instances um, or any, any other intelligence, if you will? Um, yeah, it's, it's uh, there's certainly a percentage on each side of people who just truly didn't know because in Rhode Island it is 18 and above. And then the other half of that is folks who did know who are trying to skirt uh, around the rules. Um, I don't know if that's 50-50, but you do have a, a mix of both. Okay. Okay. I'll turn it over to, uh, to Kim. Thank you, Lance. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So at the end of the quarter, our total employees was 467. We were down 10 people over Q2. Our turnover went up just slightly during Q3, again, with a little bit of competition, we, we lost a few employees. Um, our full-time employees are 305. Our part-time is 162. The percentage, 65% full-time and 34.7% part-time. Diversity, um, so our numbers re remain largely the same here. Our d diversity is down one percentage point. Veterans is 5%. Massachusetts at 64%. Local hires for our host and surrounding communities are at 34%, and our ma male-female breakdown is 51% and 49%. This is the highest female percentage that we've had. It's up two percentage points over Q2. We continue to focus on our in-state hiring. Um, during the quarter, we attended Attleboro Career Fair as well as an August Veterans Fair. We did have a meeting last week with Jill Griffin and Commissioner Stebbins, thank you for also attending. So we renewed our relationship with Mass Hire. So a great ideas came out of this meeting that we look forward to implementing. We also have already heard from Norwood and Taunton inviting us to some of their career fairs that are coming up in Q4. So we're excited about that. Next, just to give you an update about women leading at Penn. So we had our Women's Expo on September 28th. Thank you again, Gail, for being our keynote speaker. The feedback has been wonderful. It was a huge success. We're looking forward to planning another one uh, in year two, so next year. Um, we had 20 vendors that had tables from the local community. Some of them included Attleboro Kitchen and Bath, Isogenics, and Patriot Subaru. We had 100 attendees, so all from the local community, so we were very excited that we had that attendee amount. Um, another topic that we did in Q3 for Women Leading at Penn was navigating the workplace and gender bias. So we talked about four different types of patterns of behavior. We talked about strategies as to how to deal with them and, and help give this group of women the skills to be able to handle that. Pictured on the slide uh, to the bottom left is the group of our Women Leading at Penn uh, at Plain Ridge. So we were excited that they were mostly all able to attend. In Q4, we're looking forward to doing a Leadership Courage session. It'll be a virtual session facilitated by Ann Simmons, who is a board member and secretary for Global Gaming Women. And she's also the CEO and president of Simmons Group. And then we'll also have a negotiation skills session, and that's still to be determined. Yep, if I could uh, jump in here. Sure. Um, this group was outstanding. These, I did have a chance to chat with this uh, group of uh, aspiring women leaders and to hear their stories and hear where they started and how they now ha are, are acquiring the skills and the confidence, which is a really I important piece, the confidence to try to achieve more than where they are now. So I, that was the best part of the day for me, was, was uh, not hearing my own stories, but listening to these women and how, and how uh, encouraged they are by the program, how pleased they are to be in this program and part of it. And, and really their ideas about wanting to be leaders in the company. So I, I just think that this is a really good program and uh, 
to hear some of their stories was really a nice thing. And, and it's a win-win, right? Yes, You'd absolutely. like to have more women leaders, and they are aspiring to be those women leaders. Thank you. I'm going to turn can it over I, to Michelle. Actually, can I, I have a question that actually connects the last two slides. Um, you know, the point that um, Commissioner um, Cameron is making with the prior one. Uh, you did mention turnover uh, a little bit. I, I know that's, uh, you know, something that happens in, in every industry, certainly for 24-7 uh, operation. Um, is there, do you know if there's any trends relative to whether you're, uh, more people are turning over on a particular group, like let's say women or minority or local, um, which could then make the occasion of having programs like, like this one even that, that much more relevant? Uh, during the quarter, I would say that um, definitely didn't affect females because our females are actually up two percentage points over Q2. In terms of the trending turnover, uh, most of the turnover that we had in Q3 was related to competition. So having the skills in the gaming industry were very attractive to Tiverton and to MGM, and we did lose 2% to, to those two facilities. So mm -hmm. I think that's where most of the turnover was in Q3. Right. And I was not necessarily, thank you for that answer, but I wasn't necessarily talking about just the quarter. <laughs> Uh, to the extent that you, you know, continue looking at your hiring and your uh, turnover, um, I would just encourage you to look at, you know, yellow flags relative to whether you're losing more on, on one particular group or not. Yeah, I, I think that's a fair point. I think uh, typically for us, maybe myopically, we look at it by department in where we're experiencing challenges by department. I don't think we've ever gone the extra, extra mile to look at it by, uh, by gender, by age. Um, but your point's well taken. Yeah. I want to take a minute because I do want to compliment Kim. She had a, uh, she played a great host to not only ourselves, but folks from the skills cabinet, folks from the new kind of rebranded mass hire career centers from around the region. Um, one of the interesting statistics that you pulled up that Jill and I had a chance to talk about is you've had, since you've opened, you've had over 40 transfers. To other properties. To other Penn properties. In I mean, which nearly is. Nearly 300 promotions and internal transfers within Plain Ridge since opening. Which is great. And in one of the community college people was like, they ought to talk up the transfers, talk about the ability to land locally, but still have an opportunity to pursue a career in, at your various other locations around the country. Um, I think what was also great about the discussion, I think it highlights a problem John and I have had a conversation about is the region is looking for help. You guys have positions available. Patriot Place has positions available in trying to find the transit connections or the transportation connections to get people either to come south or to come north from the Fall River, New Bedford, or Attleboro area to take advantage of the, uh, of the job openings that are available. So uh, good discussion around those topics the other day, too, and something I know John is keeping an eye on as well. Thank you. All right, moving into local community. Um, as always, we continue to support various um, areas. Specifically, what we were excited about this past quarter was Relay for Life. We picked a perfect season to support the Red Sox winning Wednesdays. So <laughs> <laughs> we had uh, 17 wins, so for every Wednesday win, we gave $777 to Relay for Life, which we were excited about. In addition to that, we did a um, school supply drive, which we had over 400 customers participate in. In the picture you can see in that slide shows all of the donations that the community brought in. Uh, Q3 sponsorships. We kept many of our sponsorships we typically do, such as Nesson and the Red Sox. Um, two that we are excited that we added uh, include Patriots. Um, we were able to partner with them, and one of the pieces that we're very excited about is they are at Flutie's every Monday night for Monday Night Patriots. So they do that show live from the, the restaurant, which is an exciting addition to something we haven't been able to do in the past. Uh, we're also going to be able to send a, a guest to their flyaway trip in Pittsburgh which is another great opportunity that we've never been able to um, take part in before. 
Is this uh, tickets to the game or something? Yeah, so it's a Pittsburgh game. It's a flyaway. They um, go on the team plane, oh. team hotel, everything. So it's nice. a great experience that's once in a lifetime and it's something we're excited to be able to offer one of our guests. Terrific. Uh, in addition to that, we partnered with TPC Boston. Um, so it's a golf package that allows us to take our players to the golf course or any other uh, TPC PGA golf course across the country. So it's another great opportunity to utilize our partnerships with the community and to um, you know, create more benefits for our players that they may not be able to get other places. And for Q3 highlights, uh, we partnered with the lottery, again, on our, our Winning Wednesday promotion. So customers that came in would receive a free lottery ticket. We typically see about um, 600 responders per Wednesday. Uh, we had Responsible Gaming Education Week in August. Dinner with Doug, where Doug Flutie was actually at Flutie's, and we did a contest over the quarter where a customer won the opportunity to have dinner with Doug and um, five other of their friends. And then Murphy's boxing event. We had another event in September um, in the racing area. So those are the Q3 highlights. What was the contest that gave way to the dinner with Doug? So if you, uh, if you dined at Flutie's, you would receive a ballot okay. and you just put it in the drum. So oh. over the course of two and a half months, Mm -hmm. um, Any time you dined, you could put the ballot in, and then we just did the drawing. Uh -huh. So that's the group there that had dinner with Doug? Mm-hmm. It looks like he has his Boston College hat on, I see. Yes, he always wears that whenever he, he comes. <laughs> yeah. Oftentimes, he has us replay that game in Flutie's as oh, well. he does. <laughs> so we get to see the, the Hail Mary pass again? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice. Looks good. It's Interesting. Really good. We were down for a racing event last week, and then we had a hearing, and there were so many Red Sox and Patriots jerseys, uh, both on the gaming and, and racing side of the house. So yeah, no. good time for, for these events. Absolutely. All set? Any? Um, I believe we're good. Uh, <laughs> 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 we're not sure yet. No. <laughs> Do we have any more questions? Can you go back to slide three? <laughs> no. Um, good work. Short, but very good, obviously. Um, everything looks great. The numbers, the, uh, the work you're doing, uh, the leadership program. So uh, keep up the good work, and it's nice to see you all. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. you too. That concludes my report. Thanks. Okay, next we'll have uh, Director Griffin with the Workforce Supplier Diversity Development and the Western Mass folks. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, everyone, oops, everyone ready? Yeah, okay. Um, at the commission's request um, some weeks ago, um, we have uh, Jeffrey Hayden, Vice President of Business and Community Services from Holyoke Community College to my far right. Um, and um, next to him, we have Matt Scatella. Zatella? Matt Zatella, um, who was a student in the uh, Massachusetts, uh, the MCCTI um, line cook training program, and is a current employee of MGM. Mm -hmm. um, so we thank them both for coming all this way. and. Um, we're looking forward to getting um, an update regarding all the workforce training programs, including the gaming school, the line cook training, adult basic education, um, and accelerated high school credentialing and career readiness. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Jeff. Good morning, Commissioner. It's a pleasure to see you all again. You as well. Microphone, uh, Jeff. Microphone. Okay. 
Do I have to press them? <laughs> no button at the bottom. Which, there, you go. there you go. I do have a college degree. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, good morning to everyone, and it's a pleasure to be uh, before you again uh, and to give you an update on what we're doing in terms of workforce development training in Western Massachusetts. Um, as you know, uh, um, when we say uh, workforce training in Western Massachusetts is a partnership of thousands, um, we have uh, not only the uh, regional employment boards, the uh, Mass Hire um, uh, Hamden County uh, Workforce Board, the Franklin Hampshire uh, Workforce Board, uh, the career centers at all three locations. Um, the three community colleges are engaged, uh, as well as numerous employers. Uh, and so the network that many of you dreamed about uh, when this endeavor began in uh, 2011 actually uh, has transpired. And, uh, and we're excited about that. And through um, the mitigation funding that was made available uh, last year, uh, we actually um, took programs that were separate and then began to work together. And I think um, that has also yielded significant results for us because in addition to um, knowing what we do in terms of line cook training or, uh, or uh, dealer training, uh, we now know uh, what some of the challenges are with the Springfield Public Schools and with high set training and, and college readiness, uh, workplace readiness as well. Um, the same thing with the Hamden Prep partnership that Springfield Technical Community College is leading. And so um, uh, that integration has uh, fostered uh, different types of discussions. And so things like uh, contextualized culinary in ESOL, um, smooth pathways from Springfield Public Schools to workforce training programs at the community colleges or to uh, credit uh, programs at the colleges is, has taken place. And so um, it's moving along in a way that many of you envisioned and I think uh, moving in such a way that there's more and more creativity, more and more activity happening on a regular basis. So Mike, if I could have the next slide. Oh, is this it here? Oh, yeah, we have it. There we go. Um, so just uh, very quickly, uh, you know, as you uh, all know, the, um, this collective that's been formed, uh, it's these four programs ahead of the game, which is led by Springfield Public Schools with primarily helping individuals get a high school uh, credential uh, and, uh, and career readiness preparation. Uh, it's aimed at adults. Uh, the Gaming School Scholarships, uh, which is uh, helping uh, folks who are looking for uh, employment, primarily folks who are un unemployed or underemployed have been in that program. Uh, and we've had great success with those numbers, and I'll share those in, in a little bit. Um, and then with, uh, with Hamden Prep, uh, which is a partnership with Springfield Technical Community College, it's a high school credential, but also college readiness, uh, and, uh, and trying to broaden that net of, of creating that funnel of people who, who need basic education and get them toward workplace skills and eventually towards uh, the uh, more education or the education that they're looking for. And, and then lastly, the line cook training, which uh, has a different slice. It's looking at uh, folks who have experience in uh, the culinary field uh, and trying to advance those skills. And uh, uh, soon Matt will tell his story, uh, which I think is a great example of, of it doing exactly that. Um, and then uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, the impact uh, that we've been having, ahead of the game has enrolled 196 people. And you can see on the far right um, that uh, there are numerous outcomes. Uh, on, you know, most of those folks have received some kind of case management, which in includes career counseling. They've done a skill smart profile, which many of you are familiar with. Mm -hmm. They've been enrolled in Achieve 3000 and have obtained a certificate there. They're enrolled in ESOL or high set classes. Uh, and so far, uh, we have uh, eight who have uh, reached their high school equivalency uh, and 64 folks who have passed at least one exam of the high set uh, process. The high set has five exams. And so, uh, you know, uh, uh, over 70 uh, people have. Uh, progressed in terms of their high school equivalency with the program from ahead of the game. And most of those 
uh, successes are related to the first year of funding. And so the second year numbers we'll start to see more of. The enrollment includes this year, but uh, it doesn't really have any outcomes yet because students are in the midst of, of, of classes. Uh, for the uh, gaming scholarship program, uh, in the gaming school we've enrolled 272 people. 174 have completed. Uh, again, there's 70 who are currently in the program, so that's why the, uh, in terms of completion, it's a little bit off of term, in terms of the total enrollment. Uh, uh, through um, uh, the uh, scholarship program, we've uh, awarded 111 scholarships. Uh, and uh, in terms of job placement, for those who complete the program, we've got 81% job placement. And every day, we hear a story of, uh, of one more that gets added. So that's probably about 83% at this point. So uh, um, we're happy about that. Um, and, uh, and as I mentioned before, most of the folks in the, uh, receiving the gaming school scholarships are coming uh, from the uh, unemployment rolls. Uh, and so uh, it's certainly creating new opportunities for, for people who have not been in the labor pool. Uh, and then Hamden Prep uh, has enrolled uh, 55 folks, 49 have completed, seven have their high set, and a very similar story to ahead of the game, they're, they're, uh, many of the students are still enrolled and still trying to, uh, to get that high set uh, completion. At the same time, uh, there's been a number of unique uh, career-related uh, activities that they've done, uh, which is the whole um, uh, connection to college readiness. Uh, and lastly, with uh, Line Cook, as you know, uh, we started it uh, um, uh, at Hoya Community College uh, as a pilot. Uh, we uh, ran two cohorts with 30 people. Um, the uh, first cohort, we had eight complete. In the second cohort, we had 14 complete. Um, we learned a little bit about um, uh, what success takes uh, for an incumbent worker. Uh, and, uh, and we're happy to say that, um, you know, uh, of the 22 who completed the program, uh, all are in active uh, either employment or search for employment. Uh, and so we're hoping that that number uh, of uh, uh, 22 will be 22 uh, hired. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's been a, a, a very successful process for us. So the total is 553 enrolled, 339 completed, 193 uh, in, uh, um, placed in a job or advancing in a job, and so that reflects some of the incumbent workers. Uh, and then uh, 176 currently enrolled. Uh, I'm happy to say that that job placement uh, or advancement number actually should be somewhere around uh, 215 at this point. Uh, it just, we just got the word yesterday of an additional 20 plus who uh, have been offered positions. Uh, and so that number continues to grow for us. Uh, and, uh, you know, in terms of a job placement rate with that new 210 number, uh, we're at about 65% job placement. And, um, and I would tell you that in reality, you know, we, um, we're looking at somewhere probably at the end of the day of a placement rate between 80 and 85 uh, percent. And so, um, you know, in terms of those who have either not completed or who have dropped out or haven't um, been able to uh, complete a particular program, it's a, a relatively small percentage given the circumstances that uh, life throws at them in terms of uh, coming to us and, and looking for work. Uh, the, uh, so, um, with all that said, I think, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, um, you know, important thing to do is to really start to tell the story. And the story is not from the colleges, it's not from the regional employment boards or, or, or any of the, it's from the people who participate. And so there's a very short video clip uh, that, um, um, uh, for 58 seconds uh, that uh, has some of the students talking and then I'll let Matt take it from there. So.
It's a six week course, but mm -hmm. the hours are very flexible. They have time off away from early morning, I took them in the evening one. It's fun, you guys bring a lot of people. I see like all the how the boss is living and stuff, and that's that's where I wanna be. I was in the army, I came back home, I worked labor a little bit and then, and once this casino opened up, I wanted to get in here. This is a great opportunity for everyone. I want to be part of this movement that MGM was having to spread You know, when I walked in, the you managed to put yourself downstairs. Yeah. And we were walked up here, and we were very comfortable. MGM, like, it's not only a job I can do. I could ride with it. So that's a couple snippets of uh, folks who've uh, participated uh, uh, in the various training programs. Uh, and uh, I tell you, they, uh, uh, the best part of having a two-hour drive in this morning was that, <laughs> was that Matt Satella was uh, in the passenger seat. Uh, and uh, hearing him talk about um, his life story and, and uh, the things that uh, these types of training programs are helping to do for him uh, is really inspiring. And it reminds me of why we do what we do. So with that, Matt, you're on. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, again, my name is Matthew Zatella. Um, I'm 32 years old and I just recently completed the MGM HCC Culinary Arts Program about three months ago, a little under three months. Um, this program has brought forth a great opportunity for my family and I, um, one that just about a year ago I didn't think would be possible again. Um, even though as a child I had certain passion for cooking, I chose a different path for a long time and worked in the construction field. Um, working big jobs such as rebuilding, um, <clears throat> excuse me, rebuilding the Munson police station after the microburst a few years ago. Um, at the time that it was, I thought my lifelong career would be, um, I even started my own company called MC Hammers. I'm Matt and my, my friend Chris, um, we started MC Hammers Construction, it was our own LLC. Um, basically overnight a lot of things in my life changed. About a year ago I had a heart attack. Um, although the doctors couldn't really pinpoint the cause of it, they told me that working in construction wouldn't be best for my future any longer. Um, and they said I should think about something else. Uh, I was the sole person working in my household, which consists of a now two-year-old daughter and my girlfriend of 10 years. This was a shock to our household, obviously, and um, my shining star of a girlfriend stood strong and uh, took a running start to jump in and help take care of our family. She enrolled in the pharmacy tech program, which is also at HCC that they have there, and recently got nationally accredited and is now working in a growing field. While attending class, she came across a pamphlet for a line cook training program offered by MGM and HCC. And knowing that I had a passion for cooking, she mentioned it and told me to give it a try. After speaking with someone about the program, I, I finally started having hope again. And, um, I knew that if I tried my hardest and used all my resources to the fullest that this program provided, I could be back on track with my life and provide for them like I should. Um, little did I know it would su uh, like totally supersede any of my expectations. Uh, Chef Warren Lee, uh, my MGM HCC culinary instructor, gave me the tools and knowledge needed to not only be the very best line cook I could be, but also taught me skills that re-sparked my passion for cooking. Um, while in the program, we learned to make you know many sauces from scratch, you know bechamel and espanol and tomato sauces, things that I've never learned working you know before in culinary. Um, also, various methods of cooking, you know different proteins and um, precision knife cuts, which takes you know certain finesse. Um, not only did that program provide a hands-on experience, we also had academics, and it pushed me to learn chef's math, which is uh, a whole new world of mathematics. Really, it's got its own little world to it, um, which consists of like different ways to convert gallons to pint ratios and also methods that break down the pricing of food and all the, you know, each ingredient that it takes to cause a, a creative recipe. Um, the wealth of information was truly endless and I used it all uh, to enter a new chapter of success for myself. Prior to the graduation of my course, Chef Lee helped me to attain a job in a fine dining establishment um, as well make connections for me to acquire a position at the marvelous new MGM Springfield. Um, 
which I now have been at for just under three months. And uh, due to the training that I received when I had my two month evaluation, they revealed to me that I am one of MGM's most valuable assets and I'm versatile and can work any of the seven restaurants that make up the South End Market at MGM. And um, I, I really feel that I would never have rocketed off in such a fashion if it wasn't for this program. Um, and now because that I'm being considered, and now because of that I'm even being considered for management. This program um, has been nothing shy of remarkable. I intend to save up and continue my schooling with the program at MGM and HCC Culinary Arts Institute and one of their two-year programs that they have as well. Um, the possibilities that this has brought forth are, are truly endless, and from the bottom of my heart, I would like to thank anyone who had part in making this program possible. Um, I got another ch chance at life, and, and basically me and my family couldn't be happier. Thank you. That's a great story. Uh, great story, awesome. Matt. Thank you. Really great story. Thank you. So you're working at all the restaurants? Yeah, oh yeah. They um every week it seems like they put me in a new in a new place and um like I said after my two month evaluation they said that uh because of my versatility that I've become such like a great asset wow. to them. And what will you study when you go back? Um I'm gonna go for the accreditation program right. and um hopefully become a certified uh a certified um chef. I'll be wow. you know, have my certification. So, and you'll have opportunities to move up. Yes, absolutely, and then and then with that becomes uh, greater responsibilities and as well more financial uh, stability as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, excellent, great. Great. great story. Thank you. Great Can I also story. ask a, a couple of questions? Um, yeah. So, Matka, what, some some of the things that we uh, that we deal with um, are uh, things like um, the cost of um, the training. Uh, we've awarded scholarships, but there's also uh, a number of things that go into um, you know, the mix of making sure that people are committed. Um, do you or have you seen others which, you know, either the time or, or the cost uh, acts as a barrier in some way? Uh, can, you, can you tell us a little bit about those things? Um, not that I've experienced uh, myself or um, I do work with um, about five of the other um, candidates from the MGM HCC program and um, from from what I know, that that hasn't been any kind of an issue for them. Okay. And you also go, go ahead, Jeff. If, if if I might, so this particular program, the line cook program, uh, uh, is at no cost to the participants. Yes. And okay. So yes, in terms of time and schedule, managing their current employment, that kind of thing, that's on their end. But uh, there is no no cost to it. Uh, and and frankly, for the um, rest of the coming year, we plan four more cohorts at the same model. Great, great. Thank you for that certification. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing is, you know, Cook is also, uh, uh, or, or the restaurant business, is also a physical um, um, job. Yeah. Uh, that obviously was not uh, an issue uh, for you, uh, you know, with what you mentioned. No, I um, I have a cardiac therapist, and um, I, you know, I, I had told her that I, I used to cook, and she gave me the green light to go ahead and cook. And I actually got a job at one of the franchises, Uno's. I'm not sure if they have Uno's around the area here, but I worked at a they Uno's do. Pizzeria, um, yeah. just making minimum minimum wage. Um, and then that's where my girlfriend, you know, knowing that I do like to cook, I had found the pamphlet and, and saw a training culinary program that I could get into for free as well, like as he was mentioning. And, um, you know, now I'm, I'm well above minimum wage and I'm, I'm on the fast track to, uh, a promotion, which is you know, shooting me up to you know, they said anywhere between fifty, fifty-five thousand a year for my salary for annually. So, it's great. You know, it's really That's been a great. blessing. And finally, how else? How would you describe the the, the culture, the atmosphere at MGM? Uh, it's very diverse. It's it's very diverse. We get all kinds of crowds. Um, we get a lot of people coming in from down south and from even a couple people from the west coast. I've seen come in from California. Um, it's it's great. It's a great experience to meet new people and make contacts from not only the customers but um, as well as the other employees that work there. Because um, a lot of people came from MGM Las Vegas and um, they're over training and doing different programs with us. So I was uh, granted the opportunity to also be trained by a few of the chefs that um, you know have been masters in their trade for so many years that I can only you know, just wish to sponge up all of that from them and, and, and I was given more free lessons that I can use and utilize in my life in the future as well. That's great. Congratulations. That's awesome. to you. Thank you. 
Uh, Jeff, you mentioned a few lessons learned. You've tweaked some things. Could you have a couple of examples? Yes, I do. So, uh, uh, where do we go? There's one more slide. Uh, it doesn't appear to be uh, You want to talk to it? But, but I've got it. So, let me just pull that up. So, in, in terms of the, the lesson uh, learned, uh, Okay, I'm sorry. Um, the um, one thing that we're, um, you know, uh, uh, very keenly aware of is the intake process. Um, and so uh, working with individuals who have been unemployed or underemployed, individuals who have perhaps uh, low educational attainment and those types of things, um, we need to make sure that um, we're, um, we have them working with the right program and the right people. Um, and so um, having four partners uh, or four programs that uh, are options for folks uh, helps us uh, make sure that we're directing people in that, uh, in that area. And so, you know, if someone is uh, uh, looking for a high set, then we know uh, how to connect them. And so that integration of, uh, in the intake process is important. Uh, we do have folks who are doing uh, intake specifically, and they do that. Uh, also, they do the job placement. So it's the full continuum is is uh, what their their role is, and so that uh, makes a huge difference. So for the culinary program, there specifically were folks who were uh, coaching and helping, and then also working on the back end in terms of placement. They also are the same ones who are integrated with employers, and so although uh, you know this uh, particular line cook. Uh, program is addressing the very real and specific need that NGN Springfield uh, has. Uh, it also is a need that is, exists in the Pioneer Valley. And so uh, we're working with other employers as well. Uh, the, um, the second piece, and it's um, a little bit off of that first piece of the intake process, is to make sure um, that uh, there's career counseling components uh, as well as case management components. Uh, life gets in the way. Um, and, uh, you know, um, in, in Matt's case, life got in, in, in the way before he came to the program. But for many of our participants, it actually happens while they're in the program. Um, and, uh, you know, and things that we might not routinely think are issues. Uh, um, uh, why aren't you here today? Uh, I had a flat tire. Okay. Well, I don't have the money to fix the flat tire. I don't have the money to buy a new tire. Um, um, when I had the flat tire, um, my registration was expired, and therefore that became an issue. All those types of things of life that um, that hit folks uh, who you know are really struggling to get uh, on a, a pathway towards uh, success and stability. Um, the third thing I think that was really important for us is a thorough orientation. Um, um, to make sure that we're talking about quarry sorry issues, to make sure we're talking about uh, the employer expectations of uh, what they're looking for. You know, uh, uh, Matt and I were sharing on the way that, you know, in terms of, um, you know, attendance and what that means to be at work every day. You know, and I can remember uh, an employer of mine saying, you know, uh, no call, no show, you don't get any. You know, you do it once, bye. Don't even bother coming in. And, and so, um, although, you know, that's not the environment that many employers have today and not the environment that MGM has, uh, it certainly is something that we need to make sure that uh, folks seeking employment uh, are aware of. Uh, we also need to make sure that uh, their expectations about compensation, about benefits, and all those types of things are realistic. Um, you know, uh, um, I take this training, it means that I start as the head of the company tomorrow? No, no, it doesn't. And so, uh, really having a thorough orientation. The other piece I think um, uh, that we've learned is the whole guided pathway piece. And the gaming school actually has been the best example of that. Um, we know that you know, in terms of uh, entry level um, positions and, and first positions, you know, so uh, individuals who uh, do not have experience, that 
pairing uh, the classes, blackjack and say carnival games together and saying that's what you're gonna take. So it's not me walking in and saying, oh, I can take one of six games. N no, you know, for you as an entry level person, the, your best option is this. It helps us in terms of the timing and scheduling of it. It helps us in terms of having a cohort that goes all the way through. Um, and so that guided pathway of, of um, coaching folks. Yes, you wanna be a dealer, okay, so here's where you start. Um, you know, not the typical thing of, that we think of, you know, uh, uh, we're a college and we have uh, 95 degree and certificate programs. You know, we, we don't want folks' heads to spin, and so the, the, having that guided approach. It also enables us to, um, with a guided pathway approach, to make sure that they're getting hands-on experience either in the training classroom or uh, with employers uh, while the tra uh, training programs are going on. Uh, so it's a, a precursor to uh, folks um, uh, getting employed and, 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 uh, and being offered jobs. Um, and lastly, uh, especially in terms of uh, in, incumbent workers, um, experience matters. Um, and, uh, and trying to coach individuals and say, you know, you might not have had the greatest experience at a previous employer or, you know, it might have been a long time ago, you might not remember all, all kinds of things. But, you know, to get them to treasure and value their experience because uh, that's what employers build on. And so uh, to be able to, um, as Matt was describing, a, an interest in, in culinary, some work experience at various uh, places, uh, you know, uh, in the valley, and then uh, going away from it and then coming back, the fact that he had that experience was uh, the right platform for us to use for him uh, to, to get the, uh, the skills training he needed. So uh, those are some of the things that we've learned from this process. Uh, and we're hopeful uh, that, uh, you know, as we work with more individuals, uh, that we'll continue to refine and develop the model. Uh, our model's not static. Uh, it changes often uh, with the needs of the people that are uh, enrolling. And with that, uh, you know, uh, that's our presentation. Any last questions? Hey, just one quick one. Um, uh, gaming school, a lot of people pay for it on their own. We also, I think, stepped up with your foundation or HCC's foundation to and, and offer some STC. in STCCs to offer some scholarships. Do you see a difference in the completion rate between scholarship recipients and paying for the class themselves? Yeah. So. 81% uh, 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 on total are, are, have been hired and, and placed into jobs. 86% uh, of those who get scholarships have been placed into jobs, um, which uh, in some senses is counterintuitive, right? If I spend my own money, then I'm gonna see it through to the end. Right. Uh, but in the case of the scholarships, it's actually more individuals who are getting the scholarships are uh, getting employed, and so um, it's a tremendous uh, um, 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 benefit. I, I mean, I had hoped it would go that way. I, I didn't have the crystal ball to predict that, but you know, um, it is working, and it, it's uh, it's meaning more folks are getting jobs. Uh, so. Well, it also seems like you have a role in it with the pathway, guided pathway that you talk about, and the orientation. If right. you're targeting the right people and helping them along the way, uh, that's probably. A big factor is my yeah, and, and we know from a college point of view that uh, the more student support uh, that's available, uh, the more success there is, uh, and uh, um, the uh, the scholarship connection piece, making um, uh, or improving the access for individuals, has made a huge difference. I mean, we're an open access institution, um, and so the ability to offer these scholarships through uh, through the uh, community mitigation fund. Uh, it's really been uh, significant. Just following up on one of the points Commissioner Stebbins made, while they don't have to pay tuition for this program, you talked about some of the real life financial and time costs getting in the way. Mm -hmm. Is there any access to or thought of giving access to stipends for short term needs for someone if they have to dial back their other job or they run into some sort of mechanical issue or other transportation issue? Yeah, it, we have not been able to develop that mechanism uh, yet. Uh, we are working on it. 
um, you know, it also, uh, you know, requires the employers to be connected to us on that. And so, um, uh, you know, I, I think as we start to, um, you know, now after a year, we start to look at, you know, uh, what our, um, uh, where the gaps are for folks, uh, that you know, stipends is one of those. Uh, there are several state uh, training programs that have tried to do that um, uh, that mechanism, and it becomes tricky in terms of do they be, with a stipend do they become a community college employee? All those kinds of legal bureaucratic things that you know um, uh, my friends, the lawyers, think up in the back room. You know, it's it's uh, it's that kind of stuff that we're working through. But uh, it it makes ultimate sense to be able to say to someone. You're spending 30, 40 hours a week on training. You know, uh, here's a stipend to help you get through that. Um, you know, and you know, as Matt said, you know, he started to get a part-time job at a local restaurant, um, was going to school full-time, and then searching for uh, employment with with MGM. So, you know, all that going on at once. Um, that's okay. that's the, the best thing is that you are learning from, you know, and trying to improve. Your numbers are getting better. So that's the um, uh, the work you're doing on, you know, lessons learned, incorporating that. And it's always nice to hear stories from folks like Matt. And, uh, you know, your your enthusiasm is apparent, too. That, that would impress any employer, to be honest. You're really um, positive attitude. So thank you for coming and sharing with us. And thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you both. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll take a five minute break before we get into racing. Thanks. Jill's gone. Oh, sorry. Jill, we have one more. Um, we'll, we'll finish you and then we'll take a break. Thank you. So I'm here again to um, to talk about an RFP that we have um, that the commission has released, and it's called the Hospitality Sector Pipeline Workforce Grant Program. Catchy, huh? Uh, <laughs> so the the grant program is designed to support and place unemployed and underemployed Massachusetts residents into quality jobs in the hospitality sector, designed to establish career ladders leading to living wages. Um, so by investing in the development of and the expansion on the quality of well-defined career pathways that match training, education, and the support of services um, needs to youth and adults. Um, and we talk about the wraparound supports, um, that enable the individual to thrive as they pursue career advancement. Um, so I'm here because we really want to um, let folks know about this RFP so that we get um, maximum interest. But we have $100,000 um, and we anticipate giving individual awards of up to 50,000. So, um, on um, November 13th, very soon, we're having an information session here at the commission. Um, that's at two o'clock at 101 Federal Street. So anyone who's interested can come in and ask questions about the RFP. We will take questions in writing. Um, and the deadline for those um, questions is November 14th. And we'll post the responses. And finally, the deadline for submission is November 28th um, at 3 o'clock. Um, so I would just um, add further that the goal of this grant program is for um, collaborative, um, not individual um, responses, but collaborations to come in together 
We're not asking for um, match funding to be provided, but we're asking um, in the individual programs to uh, provide services. Um, and um, so we're, we're excited about um, the potential um, to be able to support the hospitality sector um, in the state. Um, the other thing I would mention is um, um, a portion of the funding could be used to support um, um, disconnected youth. So um, um, young people who are um, neither in school or employed. So any questions? Yeah, Jill, um, about the schedule. Um, are we making these um this grant uh, known uh, today, or has, has it been posted with some anticipation? Actually, it has been posted previously, but we okay. didn't, we obviously wanted to um, use another mechanism to let folks know. So the RFP is posted in combis, yeah. and so those who are um, registered in combis would have been alerted. Great, because I always, you know, I always like to have plenty of time for people to respond, and um, and the response time here is um, is short, and it goes through Thanksgiving. But to the extent that people know that this was coming, uh, or it has already been posted, and I do, I know you have a number of um, groups and uh, vendors, yeah. uh, vendor advisory groups, and and whatnot. That we've been could doing also a little speaking alert. tour. So we had um, a meeting. Um, uh, the day before yesterday, and there were, you know, 25 or 30 individuals, workforce training providers. Okay. Um, so, and we've been talking this up for a while. Great. So you think you'll have um, an abundance of applications? Or at least interest. Or, or at least, hopefully, a handful of really good ones. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Great. Now it sounds, sounds terrific. Another way of reaching people and providing that training, right? So we encourage folks to reach out to us via email or on our website and um, come to the information session. Well, we could also you know, post in our website and to the extent that, that we have not yet. Yeah. Uh, it actually, know. it has been posted on our website. It's okay. been, um, th thanks to um, uh, Mike, it's been um, on social media. Great. So. Great. Thank you. Mm. Thanks for letting us know about it. No problem. Thank you very much. Any questions? No, this is great. This is now the, um, it's not the first time we're doing something similar, right? Remind us. Um, you will soon see in the annual report we've had great results in um, small grant programs like yes. these. And um, I'll just add that um, we, um, the commission puts out um, a large number of dollars through the Community Mitigation Fund, and we found that by putting out smaller dollars, um, that often we have um, maybe more grassroots or smaller programs that respond. And um, given the great need in both regions for workforce training, um, we find that um, this works really well and collaboratively, so great. That's great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. I think now we'll take that five minute break. Thanks. Okay, we'll reconvene the meeting at this time. Uh, Dr. Lipo. Uh, good morning, Commissioner. Good morning. Good morning. Microphone. Good morning. Good morning. So um, today, our first item on the agenda is the racing applications for the 2019 racing season. Um, today, uh, with me is Jason Savistano, the mutual manager for Plain Ridge. Um, Steve O'Toole had a previous engagement, and then Bruce Barnett with Suffolk Downs Legal Counsel, um, and uh, Chip Tuttle had a previous engagement also. Um, so the commission received. Uh, two applications for racing in 2019. Uh, the Plain Ridge race course one was for um, 108 days beginning April 8th and going to the end of November. And the Suffolk Downs one for um, May 18th and 19th <coughs> and June 15th and 16th with the possibility of coming back um, and adding days. 
there's criteria spelled out in Chapter 128A. Um, I won't read through the um, criteria. Um, most of you have seen it before, um, and it's in the memo. <clears throat> um, and in order to uh, make their decision on these applications, um, the commission determines if that criteria has been met. Um, they consider the materials that the applicants have submitted to you already, and then we also had um, testimony at open um, meetings in each town for these uh, licenses. Um, Plainville um, meets the requirements of Chapter 128A, Section 3I, and um, they're the only facility that applied for harness racing. Um, and with the 108 days of racing, they will also satisfy the requirements um, for uh, simulcasting. Um, I outlined some of the, um, the amount of days they had raced in the past. Uh, for um, three years, that was legislated uh, through the Gaming Act, and they did meet those requirements. Um, as you know, last year, the um, number of days came in front of the commission, and they are on track to complete their 110 days of racing. Um, they do have some changes to their schedule this year. They're going to try some different things out um, in agreement with the horsemen. Uh, the horsemen have asked for uh, to have some weekend racing days uh, to allow owners who are busy during the week working to be able to see their horses racing, so they're going to try that. Um, I'm a little uh, nervous about the Sundays going against football, but, you know, it's good to see them trying some new things, so we'll see how it goes. Um, they're also going to um, do some more extensive Friday racing, so we'll see how that goes also. Dr. Leipman, when you say you're nervous, I think you mean traffic-wise? Yes, traffic-wise, and also, um, it, historically, um, it's been difficult to, uh, we usually see a little bit of a tail off when um, the football season starts and there's a big interest in football. But on the other hand, it will give the owners, um, the local owners, a chance to see their horses race. Right. And with, um, we'll see what other incentives they come up with to entice fans to right. come. And are the Sundays going to be throughout the year or at a particular time? There's a couple that are um, in different places, and then most of them are in September. And that's why the they compete with football. And then, right, it'll be competing. Yeah, if they're head-to-head -head with the Patriots, that might be tough, right? Exactly. <laughs> well, it's only every other week, because they do also. Right, and it could be a Monday night game, a Sunday night game, no. so. Yeah. Right, the schedule's not out yet, so. Right, right. <laughs> we'll have to see. Um, so there's a couple of recommendations um, that they'll have an independent expert review on the track surface. We've been doing this for the past several years, and it um, has proved valuable to have a, somebody from the outside come in. Um, they've always gotten good reviews, and sometimes these experts have a few little different things for them to try or do. Um, and then um, they will need to uh, provide their purse agreement. Um, it's uh, up at the end of the year, and they're currently in negotiations with their horsemen, so um, I don't anticipate any problem obtaining that. Um, this does require a vote of the commission. Do we have any questions here or, or before we no, move we'll, ahead? We'll take the application or, or, separately, we'll, right? Yeah, we'll do one one vote at a time. Yes. Yep. Okay. Questions of either? Came all the way here. Yes. Anything to say? Uh, or? No, I'm good. You're good? <laughs> yeah, I think we're good. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah, we were, uh, um, I guess, three commissioners were at the hearing in Plainville right. uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, as you say, things have been going well for the past few years, very, yes. very much in accordance with uh, what was anticipated. Um, the, the police chief testified, the, the fire chief testified, and, and, and um, you know, there's nothing but support over there. Um, so I think I, I think it's great. That, that sounds like the the horsemen and the track are in agreement with the number of days, at least. It's, yes, know, they're at least in the board. number, and yeah. they will they will mm -hmm. figure out the purse agreement going forward. So I think uh, I think it's a great application. Mm -hmm. um, I will move that the commission approve um, the application for racing at Plainville at Plainridge Park uh, as presented at this and discussed uh, here today. Further discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, uh, four zero passes. Have another uh, good racing season. Thank you for coming in. Thank you very much.
Okay, we'll move on to the application uh, from, from Suffolk Downs. Okay, so uh, Suffolk meets the requirements of 128A, uh, Section 3I. It's the only facility that is approved um, for uh, racing, for thoroughbred racing for next year. Um, they've outlined a general plan uh, to ensure compliance with our regulations as the property is developed. And um, I just want to say that's going to be an ongoing um, procedure with uh, Chip Tuttle and I um, and others that we may deem uh, necessary to bring in to make sure that our um, everything is the requirements are still met. Um, our executive director Ed Bedrosian had a great idea um, when Chip and I met to discuss this for the first time. Um, we had Joe Delaney, our project manager, construction project manager, uh, come also, and he had some interesting comments, which was good to uh, have that as well. So um, that's an ongoing um, discussion that we'll be having going forward. Um, <clears throat> with the um, change in the legislation, they will also meet their number of days required for simulcasting with the four days of racing. It's 1 to 50 now, and that falls in that uh, general vicinity. Um, again, um, the recommendations, um, the conditions we have are, are similar to what we've done in the past. Um, have an independent expert review the track surface before racing, and again, we've done that without any problem in the last several years. Um, we'll have them request um, before each um, uh, weekend how much money they want from the Racehorse Development Fund for the purse money. Um, and then um, if they're going to add more days to the uh, program, we ask that they notify us um, 30 days ahead of time so that we can uh, schedule staff and be sure we're prepared for that. And um, also they're in the middle of their uh, purse agreement uh, negotiations with their horsemen. So once that's done, we'll get that. Um, Alex, I would just pick, you know, I know when we were having here on the application, um, as I think about the conditions, obviously, there might be an opportunity, Bruce, to raise out in Great Barrington this year, or are we still a year away from that? Is there any prospect for that in 2019? Um, I don't think there's a there's a, a plan for that for 2019. Okay. All right. Obviously, if there is, we don't we know you'd be back in front of us. I would just. Well, it would also require a change in the legislation because that would be a off track betting situation if they want to race in Great Barrington and simulcast in Suffolk County. Um, the condition I would attach to this, Alex, and I think you talked about it, is, you know, there is some plans for construction, maybe some demolition, maybe some reconstruction mm -hmm. um, in, uh, in the back of house area. Um, I would, you know, suggest we add a condition saying once those plans are finalized that they be shared with the commission. Obviously, somebody like Joe would be great to look those over. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, uh, Bruce, if there could be some sign off by the local building inspector, depending on kind of which side of the property line it's on, um, that they also uh, provide a report or review that, you know, the work that's ongoing won't pro be of any risk to racing or any risk to the other use of the other facilities in that area. And obviously, important to us is uh, any impact on our space in the back where whether it's the test barn or what have you but kind of building that in as a condition commissioner my only hesitation with the way you phrase that is i'm not sure that the revere building the work that's being done in the barn area is all in revere right. um, the demolition there Okay. The building inspector will provide a demolition permit as required by law before that happens. I'm not sure the building inspector would be in a position to opine that the work that they're doing wouldn't affect the animals, for example. It's just not his bailiwick. Um, well, okay. Um, so certainly, we're anticipating already, you know, sharing the plans um, with the commission, uh, with Alex, with Joe, uh, if that makes sense, uh, and it sounds like it does, okay. um, to make sure, I mean, I think just the, I don't know exactly how you managed it when uh, Plainridge did all the work, 
uh, they had much more extensive construction going on throughout their their whole racing uh, uh, meet. We've got a couple of weekends going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was on the side. I, let me bring up a larger issue or la larger comment of which this would be perhaps a subset. Um, I am generally in, not in favor of this application. Um, I think it doesn't quite meet the criteria that's stipulated here. Um, there's, um, there was a time when, when, when it first came before us, uh, you know, there was a special legislation about conducting one, between one and 50 days uh, of, um, of uh, live racing in order to grant the simulcasting license. And I always thought that was perhaps, and at the time, reasonable to assume that there would be you know, a good number of race days. The bargain between the number of race days and the simulcasting was always to the tune and historically around 100 days. Um, in fact, when the Gaming Act was passed, um, the, the, the requirement to increase those days was what you just talked about, right. uh, written into law. The, the plain Ridge was required to increase to 115, 125, and so on. Um, the number of race days at Suffolk Downs for the past few years um, is been really minimal. Um, we've had, and I think, and I voted for approving those applications because there was a sense that something could be in, in the works and um, maybe a sense that um, there will be more people coming back and perhaps increased race days. Mm -hmm. um, this is clearly not the sense that I get with this application, which only goes to half the year. I don't see where there's maximization of the, of the revenues to the Commonwealth, which is a key criteria here. Um, I also, because of all the construction, and Commissioner, you weren't here for the, for the hearing, uh, but there's a lot of construction that's happening. We saw the, the lease amendments, uh, meaning demolition that, that will happen. Uh, there's, a, there's people that are gonna be using Porta Johnny's uh, who are going to come in, in for those race days. Um, there's a question in our mind um, as to how our own people are going to be, uh, you know, being able to um, regulate and, 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 and whatnot. Um, and, 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 and additionally, uh, in all the communications in the last few years, Mr. Panaret and Mr. Tuttle seem to imply that they really don't need our approval because they have the ability to simulcast by simply conducting one day of racing, which may be technically okay, but I know that that has not been our, our, our interpretation. Um, so I say, you know, if they wanna go ahead and simulcast, conduct the one day of racing, um, try that. Um, I would rather, uh, and I know we're not voting on this today, but I would rather no, not voting on the, on the request for uh, PERS money that is going to come with this application. Because while they might think that they don't need our approval for uh, the application, they certainly need our disbursement of the monies from the Racehorse Development Fund in order to conduct those races. Um, those um, monies, uh, it is my view that they have been uh, of some benefit, mostly to Suffolk Downs to a few people um, who have raced in Suffolk Downs historically, but have not, in my view, have the intention of, of the legislation, of having the benefit go to the jobs of the people that groom and train and, you know, and see the horses, because those horses come in for just a little bit and then they, they shuttle away. So this, this one year is, is also a partial year. I think it's getting, in my opinion, to the point of, is it really worth it? And if we, if I'm least, at least um, able to convince one of my commissioners here, maybe this doesn't pass. And it would be a great message, hopefully, to the legislature, something that we've been trying to send, and, and for many reasons it hasn't, um, uh, it hasn't gotten any traction, um, to try to work on a fix for this sooner rather than later. I would rather not be, and I know they're not in session currently, but I'd rather not be in the same situation that we have been in before, 
uh, July, end of July, waiting for the expiration of this uh, and you know, not knowing whether there will be um, any, any certainty uh, here. We seem to have now some real certainty, it's not absolute, uh, that the track will be closed after July uh, or so, July 1st, as per the amended lease. They, could, they tell us they could amend it further, but the reality is that the owners have other plans, um, and this sublease uh, is only getting to the last few months of you know, what they could do there. So um, if, if at least with this vote, I, which I will be voting against, we could at least signal to the, to the legislature that there's much better use perhaps for the money for persons that we will be requested from this uh, application, um, which could be the, the racing industry, don't get me wrong. It's, it's, it could be um, in, you know, accrued so that uh, if the version that we've advanced in uh, with the legislature of the, of the, the, the racing statute that we submitted, 128D, um, that would give us the flexibility to really help this industry. Um, there would have to be a, a commercially feasible um, plan, but in my view, uh, some of the purse money that could be going to live races this half year perhaps could be better used to a feasibility study, one that ha we have been asking for uh, for a while now and have not been able to, um, to fund uh, because we have felt that we, we don't have the authority and other people don't have the, um, the money either some of the horse, horsemen groups. So um, that's the reason I will be voting uh, against this. Uh, certainly when the purse money request uh, comes, if, it, if this passes, I will make the same argument, essentially. I think there's better uses for the money that, um, that will go towards merely four days of racing. Um, I don't think that brings the economic um, impact that the legislation envisioned. Look at how, uh, for the same number of purses, uh, other tracks, you know, are able to um, to run a number of many, many more days. The traditional bargain in the horse racing industry was that um, the, the 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 track gets to simulcast, which is the profitable piece um, of the of the of the operation, but in return they have to conduct a number of races, um, you know, because that's what really brings economic development. Um, this has been really, in my view, not, not worth it. They continue to simulcast uh, year round, and that's, that's fine for them, but the economic uh, impact is marginal at best, and this year is even more so. Thank you, Commissioner. Other comments? Um, I, well, I, um, I would agree with you that um, that this is not an ideal operation, that um, I think we were all hopeful that um, there would be a move or, or, or a group or someone that could um, have the wherewithal and, and the right, uh, the ability to build a new track so that thoroughbred racing could be sustained. Um, and the reason we have agreed to this uh, less than ideal plan every year is really for the benefit of uh, those in the racing community. Those, and, and there are a number of folks in the racing community, you know, that are trying to hang on breeding and um, uh, the folks that work at the track, the folks that, um, uh, that train and the grooms and, and, and the jockeys. So there are a number of people and I think for those reasons we have been um, in my mind, uh, this was very limited and not ideal, but, uh, but um, it, it kept it going a little bit here. So I um, am still hopeful that, you know, we hear about a number of groups, and I know there are a number of groups still working to have a better uh, thoroughbred racing program in the Commonwealth. So, uh, you know, I'm hopeful that that can happen and we continue to work with all of those groups and listen and take meetings. Um, but I'm, I, I still think that this is, is 
although not ideal, better than not having any racing. So I, I think that, and we know that there's certainty that, that the track will be closing. So um, again, I remain hopeful that some other opportunity, which is a better opportunity, will, will come to fruition. Um, but I am concerned about, um, we have the track inspection every year, and that's really important for, for the jockeys, for, for the horses. But the health and welfare of patrons and employees is important as well. So I would be interested, and I think you were trying to get to this, Commissioner Stebbins, some kind of a condition where during construction we make sure everybody is safe at that property. Um, and, you know, I, I go out every year. I was out there with our executive director this year, one of the days for racing. And, uh, you know, the property is in is uh, continues to age and I don't think it's uh, the care that it would if it was utilized more often than a few days a year. So I am concerned about that and making sure everyone is safe. I know there's barns being removed, there's uh, soil in the parking lot, there's different things that are planned for these four days and I'm just, I want us to make sure that we are fulfilling our responsibility to make sure everybody is safe out there. Not the horses, of course, but, but also all, all of the folks. So however we can incorporate not only a safety check for the track, but, um, but to, you know, just assurances. And I know you're, you're each having meetings to, to understand this plan as, as it evolves, but that would be important to me that everyone out there is, is in a position where they are safe um, for those four days. Yeah, so um, first let me apologize for n not being here on time. Uh, secondly, uh, on this issue of sort of safety, uh, I would think about sort of two categories. One is obviously uh, tremendously important uh, public safety, uh, mm -hmm. Suffolk, employee, uh, Suffolk employee safety, our employee safety, um, uh, you know, the, the jockeys and all the folks who mm -hmm. uh, uh, would be at the track. Um, so I would want that to be a condition precedent, which I think is a combination of, you know, building inspectors saying the building is still safe, um, sort of also common sense of looking at the place and saying, you know, geez, if there's tractors and in, 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 uh, big construction uh, 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 vehicles all over the place, we'd want to consider that. The second uh, thing I would um, suggest is I'd want to hear you know, a week ahead of time from uh, Director Lightbound that she is confident that our staff mm -hmm. can fulfill their regulatory duties, uh, which go might go above and beyond just actual safety. I mean, if they're, they have to test horses and do all those things, there's got to be sufficient place for that to happen, and staff's got to be capable of doing that. So mm -hmm. um, I think there are sort of two preconditions. One is this general overall safety. Um, and the other is our regulatory capabilities, that we can fulfill our regulatory capabilities in the current environment as it will exist at the time of racing, which I don't think we know right now. But, um, you know, if, if approved with those conditions, Director Lightbound could certainly, and I think she would be involved in what's happening, but a week ahead of time, understand uh, the environment on the ground and say, yes, we're, you know, given these modifications, whatever we need, we can do it. Or no, we, we can't do it. Mm -hmm. and well, let me, let me mention that because I have, uh, I was trying to articulate essentially this as the opposite side of the same coin. Uh, while we could place a condition, uh, I think there's enough uncertainty as to whether operations as we have previously, you know, um, uh, knew that they're going to be present. First of all, it's half a year. It's not the same as any other year. I do understand, and I did vote, and I mentioned this, Commissioner, um, uh, for prior prior uh, applications uh, to try to help the racing industry. I, I, I believe that most of those benefits have only gone to a very small handful of people. Um, and that is really the nature of the that, that market. Um, and I, I really think and hope that by withholding or eventually not disbursing those purses, this purse money, that could be yet another tool, again, provided that we are able to call attention to the need to really address this situation 
uh, at the legislature for us to really help them more in the longer term. This help, in my view, is, is at best really very short term at a time when we have half a year, dwindling race days, enough uncertainty as to the, the, the operation because there will be demolition. There is, as per the lease, the owner, which is not Suffolk Downs, can put in a lot of dirt uh, on, on the parking lot. So there is enough questions into how that operation is going to be. We could place conditions, but my point is there's enough certainty when, that when we add all those other factors, it might be that time for us to say, not worth it. That's the position I'm advocating for. And call attention to this and let all the groups that will certainly say, what do you mean there's not even four days this year, to start advocating for a real long-term solution to this um, legislation that has been, quite frankly, in limbo for the past four years, three, three and a half years. Well, I, I um, again, I don't think much has changed. Uh, I know that time is going on, and, and you're correct. There hasn't been movement um, towards something more permanent. But this is a very, very passionate group, and um, which and is, one of which their is also divided, by the way. Which is divided. Oh, I, I would agree. There is not. Um, there was. There's not one group in solidarity moving in one direction. I would agree with that. But I do think there are um, folks with jobs and f local folks who do look forward to this every year and uh, are working towards something more permanent. And we're all hopeful that that can happen. Um, and I, I believe that our team has the ability to assess um, if we were to approve this conditionally, then the conditions would have to be met. And that would give us another opportunity to make sure that uh, folks are safe and um, uh, before we, we go ahead and, and have the meet. So um, I think our I ability to assess, point, so. to assess it, you know, and I, I think our ability to, uh, to change things dramatically sort of dwindles if we approve this, this, uh, this application. Um, I, I think, and I'll remind, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll mention this for the benefit of uh, Commissioner um, uh, O'Brien, because um, when we first, con when we conducted the hearing for the first time, the one that came f before us for three days at the time, if I don't, re if I remember correctly, um, there was there were a number of people who were effectively saying a lot of what I'm saying. Um, they were saying it's not worth it. Uh, these industry might be better off uh, letting the monies that come from the Racehorse Development Fund that, it, that are at least uh, identified for uh, the, the, the thoroughbreds accrue for what could be a longer term solution. Um, and, and again, I did vote mm -hmm. for those. Mm -hmm. At the time, it seemed the reasonable thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, I am now thinking when you add all these other components, uncertainty about the site, half a year, last year for sure, to the discomfort that, we, that I had at least on, on, on the divided group of horsemen who were essentially saying, I don't think it's worth it, better, uh, something is better than nothing. Um, my hope is that at least we could also signal, not just mm -hmm. uh, save what we will eventually disperse for these days, but signal to the legislature that this is really now needs to be addressed. And if you don't want to address it, there might be even better uses for that money that belongs to the Commonwealth to be, you know, like, uh, like there have been at least some, some, um, some efforts in the past. They haven't done it. Uh, there is still an, in, uh, uh, um, at least um, in my opinion by some, the, um, the wish to make uh, uh, this industry continue. Uh, and again, I think that with, with the flexibility that the legislation that we filed would bring this commission, we would be, it is my hope, to be in a better position to save the industry, or help the industry, not save it, not necessarily. Um, at, at least try to, try to help them uh, in a more longer term. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Dr. Leipam, do you have anything no, to Commissioner add? Commissioner O'Brien, what's... Oh. Uh, <coughs> oh, sorry, go first. Uh, well, First of all, we, we do 
get a lot of money from Suffolk Downs. And the, you know, you'll see it in the RN reports. Um, they uh, handle, you know, I think, I should know the figures, but I don't, probably more than Plain Ridge does. Um, and, you know, so we, uh, the income that we get from them is significant. Um, yep. Even though, you know, you may say the four days or the eight days or whatever, with the simulcasting and the account wagering, it's huge. Um, yep. It's a big impact on us, on the commission. I do, I realize that. And right. thank you for highlighting that because I only spoke to it initially very in the passing. Um, if uh, Suffolk Towns thinks that they only have to conduct one day of racing to continue simulcasting, the same thing accrues to the Commonwealth because they continue to simulcast. That's true. If they, yeah, so if they're allowed to. it is, I am talking, so I'm assuming that they would do that. Uh, why wouldn't they? Um, and, um, you know, <coughs> let, let, the, let the money that comes from simulcasting accrue to the Commonwealth. And, you know, and, and that'll be that. Uh, when we only think about how much we're going to disburse for the live racing days, uh, that's the cost-benefit analysis that I'm trying to articulate here that is really not worth it. Um, that's on the criteria about maximizing state revenues. I think, you know, I think we just, it's, 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 it's costing the Commonwealth in the end. Um, and it's costing the industry, you know, maybe not in the short term. I understand the argument that it's a powerful one uh, because some people have already made have plans or whatnot. Uh, but it is, it is a unique year and I think we find ourselves, I'm just at the point of is it's in my opinion it's quite simply not worth it. I think with um, Suffolk Downs or not Suffolk Downs with the new landlord um, knocking down barns I think it's going to be very clear to people that you know um, it's not going to be continuing on and that um, something needs to be done for thoroughbred racing and and we've all been through this journey for several years now where it was not the intent that thoroughbred racing would be limited to you know at the most eight days. Um, and it was seen as a bridge. Um, and I think we're getting to that point where um, it's not going to be at Suffolk. Um, from the regulatory standpoint, and I think it's a great idea to put um, a requirement in that, you know, we meet, the, that we work with Suffolk to make sure everything's safe and that we can regulate. Um, the um, parts that are going to be taken down are on the backside at this point. so. Um, I've been assured that our office in the grandstand will still be there. There um, will be some inconvenience with the parking, um, but we're still going to have our offices there, and so that'll be fully functional. Um, the test barn area is going to be left alone, so that will also be there. Um, so again, we, we do a pre-meet inspection every year anyway um, to go over things, but um, mm -hmm. it looks like that part of it won't be different from any other year. Um, what will be different is um, the uh, barn area um, and the things like the porta potties, um, things like that. And I've already had some discussions with Chip on that um, and some of the other issues that it brings up. So uh, I think we can probably manage that mm -hmm. for you know four days. And again, I, it's, it's not an ideal situation. I know the horsemen that do get that purse money are really um, happy that they do get that purse money. And we do see quite a few locals that are getting it. So. I, I, I just want to I want I want to get back to you know the condition I had suggested and, and, and there's some details there about you know what role a local building inspector might play. Um, but I do want to pick up on um, Commissioner Zuniga's comments because you know I, I think all of us have been frustrated by the lack of movement. We've been stuck in this slow grind to a you know a you know, unfortunate conclusion that we have not been able to um, find a way to bring parties together to get the interest of the legislature to figure this out and try to find a long-term solution. And a lot of those stakeholders need to be at the table. Um, so I, I, I certainly agree with your frustration. I sense your frustration. I, I would just... Um, not feel that the way to get the legislature's attention, if I'm listening to you correctly, would be to vote down an application that, you know, essentially to, you know, uh, to the extent it does comply with the law. Um, I think the bigger message is, is going to be sent that um, when Suffolk closes their doors 
and then what becomes next for the Massachusetts thoroughbred industry. And as Commissioner Cameron pointed out, there have been interested parties that have been poking around and looking at different proposals. Um, you know, I would like to see that that be the motivation to get all of us back to the table and think about the legislation that we have filed year after year that uh, usually gets set aside for you know a, a, an extension. Um, but we're going to be back at this next year with either an application for thoroughbred racing in front of us or not. Um, so I, I'm not necessarily um, uh, supportive of the idea of, um, and again, if I'm misreading you, to, to reject the application because we know it's not ideal. It's never been ideal. Um, but I, I would like to try to find a different way to send a, a message to the legislature that we need their attention and their partnership on this um, rather than to uh, have a vote and, and reject the application. But I do Well, I think, I, I, I think the, the message might not come from us. The message, in my view, will come from the people who were expecting to raise, albeit only four days, uh, to say, now we cannot even you know, raise the four days. And I know there's benefits. It, this is why it's, it's a bit of a gray judgment call situation. Um, it's half a year, something we've never done before. Um, you know, it, it, there, is, there will be certainty when the, when, the, when the track closes, that's for sure. Um, but um, I don't think it will be us necessarily with this discussion, uh, um, you know, knocking on the, on, uh, uh, getting the attention of the legislature. It would be people who are now saying this closure is for real to the extent, to the, to the point that uh, the commission felt uncomfortable in, at least that's where I am, mm -hmm. in approving a partial too little uh, to the point of um, not worth it application, which is what's before us. Um, I see a lot of merit in what Commissioner Zuniga has said, particularly when you look at the cost-benefit analysis for the Commonwealth in maximizing the revenue. Um, my hesitation in voting no at this juncture is the timing, is the impact it would have to the industry in having any leverage, I feel like the leverage in, in existing, ongoing, however limited industry might have to go to the legislature and say, not only can we not have what we had last year, which is have it expire with no action and then have to do special session to have things renewed, we need certainty. And to, to not have it at all in, in the context of thoroughbred racing, I think, cuts their legs up from underneath them. And while I hear you in wanting to you know, ring a bell to, to make the legislature understand enough is enough. I, I'm newer to this than you are, but my my you know study of what's happened, uh, you know, and the decline since the since the changes have gone into effect, it is not sustainable. I also think, as a practical matter, this is it. To your point, with the with the facility undergoing the transformation that, that it is undergoing, um, and the the current state of the legislature in terms of what they did last year, what they say they will do this year. To me, um, if a condition is added to this, that this approval is conditional upon further approval by this commission in both the C, suitability of the track for the participants and the attendees and the employees of the Gaming Commission, and that that approval be renewed seven to 15 days prior to the racing sessions. Uh, I am comfortable voting for it in this circumstance. While I hear everything that you're saying, and I think it is time to look at it, I do think it's, it's draconian to, to say no to the application at this vote. So I would vote to approve it under the adding that fifth condition. Sounds good. I mean, um, your position um, is your position. I think that we were always in, this, in the position of approving or not. Uh, the, the, the time frame of, um, of the, the um, the application deadlines and the approvals was always yearly. Uh, it was always at least conceivable that any one application will not be approved for the next calendar year come November. November 15 is the, the deadline, right? right? Yeah, um, November 15. So that was uh, the only thing that I would just opine is different. It's not necessarily cutting the, uh, you know, the feet from under them. Uh, this was at least Legislatively, always a possibility. Just to clarify, I think I, I say that just in the current context of mm -hmm. the facilities as well. Yes. That to say that at a time when there could be another facility 
versus now when that facility will be gone. I think that's the comment that I made. Yeah, yeah. Just to no, clarify. I, I understand. I think, um, again, we're, we're, we're taking the same factor and just interpreting it differently. Uh, the fact that there's now all these certain demolition to come, um, questions about the safety and accessibility and, 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 and really purpose of the property, uh, in my view is, again, goes on the column of not worth it. Let's, let's, just, let's just save some of the money that will be requested uh, uh, you know, for this for this application, see the, the, this application comes with a very important provision, which is those um, requests for purse monies. Um, again, I'm going to be voting. You know how when it comes to that, but um, um, it's just too little to, in my opinion, not worth it. Are we ready for a motion? Um, Sure, I would move that the um, the commission approve the application for racing in 2019 by Sterling Suffolk Racecourse LLC, uh, with the conditions as outlined in the packet, and hopefully, if I can word this correctly, the addition of a fifth condition, which is any construction, development, or demolition plans be shared with the commission. Uh, and a review by a local building inspector. Obviously, they're the person issuing any demolition or work permits uh, uh, and subject to review by the commission, uh, again, with the ultimate ability or authority resting with us to decide whether racing is allowed or not, depending on those conditions. I, I would move to further amend that recommendation to just make it clear that that would be subject to further commission approval based on the criterion you set forward in condition five based on that and then i would second that motion further discussion all in favor aye aye we did we had a second uh, uh opposed. those opposed nay okay so a three to one vote to approve this license with the conditions as outlined. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> the um, capital next improvement fund. next, right? On, uh, yes, our agenda is uh, the Suffolk Downs request for capital improvement funds. Um, today mm -hmm. I have with us Chad Borg, our senior financial analyst. Mm -hmm. um, I want to thank Doug O'Donnell, who was our um, financial analyst for years. He's been um, great in sharing his expertise with Chad and uh, Chad's jumped right in and um, hopefully leave some of the work with uh, that Doug's been doing. So I'll leave it to Chad now. Uh, good morning. Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning. Good morning, good morning and welcome. Thank you very much. Um, so throughout the billing cycle, we collect um, funds for to be held in the Capital Improvement Trust Fund. Uh, monies from the trust fund are paid out upon the commissioner's approval of both a request for consideration uh, for which will allow them to move forward with a project um, and then also a request for reimbursement which will provide payment for the work or purchase completed. Uh, this item we have today is a request for consideration um, from Suffolk Downs in the amount of 94000 $46.17. Um, this amount reflects project numbers 2017-01 through 16. Um, and uh, we are asking for the commission's vote on this item. Questions? I'll refrain from making my usual comments about the capital improvement <laughs> trust fund, but um, Chad, is there any reason that uh, there's uh, no 2017-15 project? Uh, yes, that is. Um, they uh, do not have the uh, backup work for that yet, and okay. they said it is in the pipeline. Okay. Yeah. It appears to me that all the appropriate uh, uh, approvals are accompanying each of these requests. Yes. You've had a chance to review all of those documents? Yes, I went through all the documents and calculated the numbers for each item. Great. Uh, 
Madam Chair, I move the Commission approve the request for consideration of the Suffolk Downs Capital Improvement Trust Fund uh, projects as outlined in the packet. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. aye. I think I heard everyone say aye, so it's a 4 nothing vote here for the um, capital improvement. Moving on to the quarterly local aid payments. Uh, yes, in, in accordance with Section 18D of Chapter 58, local aid is payable to each city and town within which racing activities are conducted. Uh, the amounts are computated at 0.35% times the amount wagered during the quarter and at six months prior to, to payment. The total amount for local aid for this quarter is in the amount of $175,321.72, and this amount reflects the total handle for January, February, and March of 2018. On the second page, you will see a breakdown um, of the handles for the quarter, as well as the distributions to each city and town. Um, we are asking for the commission's vote on this item. Questions? Do we have a motion? Madam Chair, I move the commission approve the local aid quarterly payments uh, through September 30th, 2018. It's included in the packet. Uh, further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Four zero. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioners. We, um, we missed our executive director's um, update, his administrative update, because he was uh, tied up with a, an important matter. But our executive director is here now and uh, I believe ready to give us an update. I am. Um, since it's close to noon, I'm just going to go with good afternoon. Mm -hmm. um, I do want to update you on a recent development in our investigation. Late yesterday, our outside counsel learned that Steve Wynn filed a lawsuit in Nevada against the director of the Investigations and Enforcement Bureau, the Commission, and Wynn Resorts. This new lawsuit, among other things, seeks to prevent the release of the Investigation and Enforcement Bureau's investigatory report. Our legal counsel is reviewing the complaint. We were not surprised by this development. In fact, we had already retained local counsel in Nevada to help us litigate these issues as quickly as possible so we don't delay finishing the report and then having an appropriate adjudicatory hearing. I know this is sort of a, a thing, and a, a, but it's, it's a brief update, and all I can tell you is when I have more information on this, I will update you. Um. This, what, what does this mean towards our ability to see the report at this juncture? Uh, you will not be able to see the report until these issues are uh, resolved. We need to resolve these issues to make sure that the report that is given the commission is a report that you will use in the adjudicatory hearing. That's my best guess at mm -hmm. this point. Mm -hmm. And the complaint was filed in Nevada? In, uh, in Nevada, in Las Vegas, yes. And we have outside counsel assisting us there? We do. We do. And it's too soon to, to know how long any process would take there? Uh, when I say this report just got filed, I literally mean like 4.30 Las Vegas time yesterday. So. It's uh, the old term, hot off the presses, would be appropriate. And are you, as well as our uh, legal counsel, reviewing the complaint as we speak, I suspect? Uh, that one of the reasons I was not here right on time this morning. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? No, it's clearly um, uh, it's something that you'll have to look into with the good help of General Counsel Blue and our outside um, uh, uh, counsel. Um, 
You mentioned that um, the company is also party to this lawsuit. The company is. The company, Wind Resorts. Yes. Um, that, yeah, any, that's any, right. any, any word? I mean, you, you obviously have not had an opportunity to talk to, um, to them? Uh, only to both acknowledge that the complaint exists. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. Well, uh, we appreciate the update, and we will look forward to um, further updates here and, you know, our recommendation as to how to proceed. Thank you. Anything else with your update? No, that's it. Thank you. We'll move on to uh, commissioner updates. Are there any commissioner updates today? Uh, I just have one. I want to uh, thank Director Griffin and uh, Crystal Howard for a great event that they organized and put on uh, here uh, in our commission space on Monday. Uh, they invited all of our licensees, a number of different associated veterans groups and organizations that support veterans to try to uh, uh, gin up interest for veterans to have an opportunity to do business with one of our licensees. So we had a, a number of uh, kind of exhibit booths from various organizations. We had over 40 people uh, easily filling the room and uh, we were happy to be joined by the Secretary of Veterans Services, Secretary Irena, who came and not only spoke about Massachusetts veterans, but about uh, the good partnership we've forged with his office. Um, but, uh, you know, the feedback from everybody that came was, you know, excellent networking opportunity and certainly want to do the best we can. This is actually National Small Veteran Business Awareness Week, so the, uh, the event was timely and, uh, again, as, uh, as we saw with Plain Ridge's report, um, you know, the, the goals were kind of based not on a lot of information, but we certainly want to work with our licensees to make sure that uh, their goals are the floor, not the ceiling, and that they can surpass those numbers. So, uh, great thank you to all of our licensees for showing up. Thank you for your leadership in this area, Commissioner. Commissioner this is uh, important, important and good work. Thanks. Anything else? We have a motion. Move to adjourn. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, meeting is adjourned. Thank you.